Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got a very special custom knife overview and presentation to share with you guys. This gorgeous piece is a Peter Carey Custom Cayman. Oh my goodness. A lot going on here, and we're going to talk all about it. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Sierra underscore Bound on Instagram for sending this amazing piece in, in for a review. Please, uh, and by the way, no, I don't get to keep this. <laughs> this is going back. Please follow him. Uh, believe me when I say he has one of the most incredible knife collections you have ever ever seen. It is worth your time to follow Sierra underscore bound on Instagram. I spend uh, a, a good part, you know, a, a small chunk of each week just looking through his stuff. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Scott, for sending this in. Uh, before we get started here, if you have been around on my channel for a while, you know the drill with stuff like this, right? If you are new to my channel, this is a custom knife. And, you know, depending on who you talk to in the knife world, people have a different definition of custom. Some people will say it can't be custom unless it's entirely handmade, which is Again, only something that certain people think. Um, you all have other people say, well, you know, I have some machine-made elements, and then you have some handmade stuff, and it, a lot of times there's just really expensive materials. It's a combination of a lot of things. Custom knives are not mass-produced. They're not even made in small batches. They're made one at a time to spec. You know, they are specially made. This particular piece, uh, I don't believe there is another one uh, of these. Sorry, I'm going to get this little tiny little there we go little piece of debris there that I'm trying to make sure it's not in the shot because I want you guys to be able to appreciate uh, all of the teeny teeny tiny little details on this knife there we go uh, but anyways uh, this particular piece was an Instagram auction piece that uh, Sierra underscore bound one uh, this is to date the most expensive knife that I have ever shown on my channel but it was an auction piece right so do with that information what you will uh, for those of you who are not familiar with stuff like this, we are talking multiple thousands of dollars. Now, Peter Carey works with various materials and his knives will come in, I don't necessarily want to say different tiers, there's just going to be less expensive and more expensive versions of these knives. It depends on the materials that are involved and the total amount of time that it takes to create the object, right? So obviously, this knife is not going to be worth it to the vast majority of people. Nobody is laboring in, under any delusion there. Uh, this was made for somebody who values specifically this knife made in this way with these materials, and it was already purchased, so you don't have to trouble yourself with the whole overpriced, underpriced thing. Custom knives are of that nature. They have been since knives were a thing, right? Um, so they're only going to be uh, valued a specific way by uh, small groups of people or the people who are looking for specifically those options. Uh, when I review custom knives, I don't really review them. I uh, am a knife reviewer who generally likes to focus on production knives, like the Spyderco uh, Para 3. I'm not somebody who feels like he's completely and totally qualified to critique the work of a um, custom knife maker who's been doing, I mean, I, I can't. What I do like to do is present this stuff, let you guys look at it. This is going to be more of an eye candy type of thing, and I'm going to give you all of the information about this knife. Thanks to my generous patrons who are supporting me. There's a link for Patreon right down below, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. We'll go ahead and do a few size comparison, a couple of measurements. We won't do the whole thing today. I'm trying to keep this bead away from the... <laughs> uh, up against the Ontario Rat Model 1, and its little brother, the Ontario Rat Model 2. You can see here, this is not a small knife. It's definitely a full-size knife. It might be helpful to actually measure it. How about that? Overall length of the uh, Peter Carey Cayman coming in at... My measurement is about eight and an eighth. Yeah, it's not quite eight and a quarter. Blade length is definitely about three and a half inches and your cutting edge is about three and a quarter. That's gonna be a perfect size for a lot of people. We'll go ahead and put it up against the uh, Ritter Hogue because that it's almost exactly the same overall size as the Ritter Hogue. And uh, how about the Benchmade Bug Out and then we can be done. So there you go. This is a, a knife that um, definitely feels full size. I'm not going to call it unbelievably thick. I'm going to give you a demo of the action real quick. Oh my gosh. This is running on skiff bearings. The action, you know, I, I, I generally have uh, weird expectations uh, when it comes to action with custom knives because everything is so, like, it's so perfectly dialed into what that 
maker is doing because there's so much manual effort that goes into the knife that custom knives tend to feel unique or different uh, from like a production, like what we define as a perfect production detent. So think, um, what's a great example? Oh, the 0562 has that nice crisp breakaway and then glide and click into the open position. That to me is a, a good example of a production uh, perfect detent. What's weird is that this knife, while it still has all the elements of having that uh, custom magnificence, right? It has that really crisp, <laughs> you know what I mean? That click, click, uh, the crisp breakaway of the detent. The detent is tuned perfectly. A snap is good. The, um, the action in between is completely, <laughs> what I mean, this is the type of fall shut action that I like to highlight because it's, yeah, it's fall shut. Sure, the blade might be kind of heavy, but we're talking completely smooth surfaces on the inside. Uh, there's, it's perfect, perfectly consistent from uh, the time that you, here, take your knife right now, whatever you're holding. I'm not gonna, you know, uh, like it's gonna sound like I'm giving everybody a, um, here's why your knife isn't as good. No, but if you take the, if you take your knife and you, uh, take the blade out like this and just sort of wheel it open. You're going to be able to feel little tiny imperfections on the surface of your blade. You're going to feel like a bump, 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 and then maybe it kind of gets stuck. Right uh, now, that can be a bunch of different things. That can be debris that's in there, or it could just be that the surface, like when they, you know, cut these blades, they cut the parts. Right? It's just like a continuous, you know, on a manufacturing level. It's just everything is just, you know, this is the level of quality they expect to get from it and it just needs to be at least this good and then it, which is fine because that works just fine you know for the average person that's going to take their knife out and use it obviously the only thing that they're concerned with is does it stay closed when you're ready to deploy it can you easily break the detent and get the knife to deploy smoothly right this is like uh i have no idea <laughs> What, what extra effort is going on inside of this or in other custom knives where I have just ranted and raved about the action. But that detent ball is traveling along an oiled, glassy surface, or at least it feels that way. And the combination of that and the skiff bearings, this is an example of perfect action. It is, you know, a luxurious fall shut action and not a manufactured fall shut action like what you could expect from Civivi or, uh, you know, we knives, zero tolerance, you know, knives that range anywhere from the budget world up to your, you know, two, three, four hundred dollar production knives. This is something else. Wonderful. And those of you who have experienced skiff bearings, right? Um, they can provide that feeling on a much less expensive knife. I've talked with a lot of people who have gone ahead and purchased skiff bearings that are made, um, for, you know, various production knives and they're, oh my gosh, you know, it's night and day. Um, so I think it's a combination of two different things. But then again, I don't know because I don't make these. It's really hard. It's just me going, this is what I think based on what I feel, right? It's a long way of saying the action is very impressive and I don't know exactly what's going on there. Thickness on this guy, you can see here we're looking at, look at this. We have, uh, I guess I'm going to call it orange peel uh, textured liners with Damascus. Lava lamp Damascus. Uh, scales on top. God, that's gorgeous. The thickness on this guy, it's a little bit thicker than the pair of three, but not crazy. And everything is contoured. Oh, beautiful. Um, what does this weigh? Does it even matter? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys are curious to find out how much it weighs. I'm sure there's a lot of people going, what is this? What am I watching? How weird. Yeah. Welcome to my channel. <laughs> uh, I got about 2000 of these. Um, yeah, 6.1 ounces. I don't think that's uh, like, oh, wait, should we weigh the bead? At <laughs> 6.3 with the uh, with the bead, I'm sure that's optional. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. Does that matter? I don't think that it does. Um, these are the types of knives that people, you know, crown their collections with. Or if you're Scott, it's just a part of his collection. Um, can you take this out and use it? People always be, uh, seem to be confused by the idea of something like this being used. Uh, I think the idea is that it is made to be collected by enthusiasts and nothing else. Yes, but when you say that, what people hear is, 
the materials are not dura durable enough to actually be used and it is more of an art piece, a delicate art piece that cannot be used. No, quite the opposite. Blade Steel is RWL34, which is very similar, very, very similar to CPM 154. It's actually one of the steels used um, in Damascus Steel. It's in combination with PMC 27. Very performance oriented and uh, certainly a steel that a lot of custom makers use. Yeah, that is 100% performance oriented steel. Absolutely. Timascus, fold in layered titanium. Uh, yeah, that's going to be really durable. The liners, titanium, very durable. Pocket clip, I mean, all of this. This is 100% a knife that is beautiful and most likely will end up, was meant to end up as part of somebody's collection. But if Scott decided to take this thing out and use it and beat on it, would it hold up? Well, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Whether or not somebody does that is an entirely different, it's an entirely different thing, right? And by the way, it's only up to the person who ends up with it. It's not up to anybody else. Um, what else should we do here? I'm not going to do the hardware check. I'll tell you guys right now, all of the hardware on this guy appears to be T8. So if Scott were to decide, I'm saying Scott because, again, there's just one of this knife exactly. There are other Caymans, but this particular one, if Scott decides to take this apart, then he probably won't have that difficult of a time. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, let's go ahead and move in, um, talk about some other things. So um, ergonomically, this knife is very comfortable. Edges right here, I mean, the the, the knife is contoured. I'm going to wipe this back off, by the way. my I'll show you guys. Timascus, um, and, and a lot of people know this, but as you touch this stuff, your the oils from your hands will dull it. So if I get the uh, cleaning cloth out here, I'm going to just polish one area of this. And you can see what happens is it brings like this area compared to this area, it brings out those colors and it, it once the oil is, is removed, then all of the, you know, extra sheen starts to come through. And I think you can hit this with, ooh, I don't want to give people the wrong information. Uh, if Scott's down there, he can tell you what to clean the surface of Timascus with so that you can bring that shine back out. But again, as soon as you touch it, it's just going to, you know, it's, it's anodization. So it's the same thing that happens with like, you know, any, any titanium surface that's anodized. Um, but, um, yeah, the, uh, the scales are contoured, very comfortable and there is an edge or like a corner. We'll just go ahead and do this to all of it. So you guys can see, there we go. Yeah. Vibrant springing brought back out. There is a bit of a corner right here, but it's not sharp. So the end result is that maybe we should talk about the Timascus first before I go ahead and put my hands all over it. <laughs> that lava lamp Timascus is super duper busy. I can only imagine they call it lava lamp Timascus because it looks like a lava lamp. Um, different from, I've got a couple of different examples of Timascus in my own collection that I can show you guys uh, for comparison. Um, most of your Timascus that we see nowadays, we'll get out the, um, polishing this guy up too, we'll get out the, um, uh, the isotope from Vero. This is nice Timascus, just like your your standard white Timascus, I guess. Um, and uh, that's going to look good, but definitely different than your lot. Definitely less busy, less complicated than your lava lamp Timascus. And I don't know if it's because there are more layers um, in the lava lamp, right? Um, there's another example, right? Uh, Timascus will have, of course, different patterns and things in it. In this case, we have texturing, so it does not necessarily appear as vibrant as uh, the stuff. I think the stuff with a smoother surface and, and you know less texturing will probably appear more vibrant, but this is some of the most vibrant uh, Timascus that I've ever seen. Now, different people have different opinions on Timascus. Uh, some people hate it. Some people love it. You can hate and love whatever you want. This thing exists and it was already bought, right? A lot of uh, Timascus is just kind of a, a material that you see on a lot of hyper expensive. I mean, it's not, it's not cheap to make. Absolutely. And then you gotta, uh, you know, polish it and finish it and get it to fit and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, it's going to cost, you know, regardless of how you feel about it aesthetically, it just does cost money to put it on a knife. But most makers don't, you know, most custom makers don't exclusively work with Timascus. So you generally have an option if you want it as the entire scale or the entire frame or, you know, the, uh, just an inlay or something like that. Uh, my opinion is, is that this is gorgeous. Um, this is some of the coolest looking Timascus that I have ever seen. And I just think the work that was done here is magnificent. 
Um, your ergonomic lines on this thing, I mean, if we're just like, let's pretend that this was just titanium and, you know, nothing crazy going on here, that this was not a, an art piece on top of a, a functional tool. Yeah, the ergonomic lines are great. And because the pocket clip is flat and also contoured, edges all knocked down, no hotspot whatsoever. This is really, really comfortable. The lines are just perfect. The flipper tab has a bit, just a few, you know, corners here. Um, again, I don't know how much it really, how much it makes sense to critique that because, you know, approaching it the way that you would as a flipper tab, it were, it functions perfectly. No double clutch. You can see there, just perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, wonderful. Also, I'm a big fan of the lines of this. Uh, I, I like how this looks. Is, is it my imagination or does it kind of look like a caiman or an alligator, right? That's what it came. Is it came in a crocodile or an alligator? I, can, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it maybe, maybe it's just because it's called that, but it, it kind of reminds me of that. Um, the blade is absolutely stunning. We have a, uh, hand rubbed and completely and totally hand ground. The blade is absolutely a hand ground blade, uh, and then hand finished, uh, hand rubbed satin, which looks beautiful. Uh, we have a recurve right here. And then this sort of, it's a tanto, but it almost looks like a hatchet tip, right? You can see that it's much thicker. Obviously that's intentional. Um, the way that they, it gets thicker out here. So the grind, he started the grind back in a ways, but look how it's polished. <laughs> Very sharp. Absolutely. Um, absolutely functional. No question there. We have a flat that runs out about, where's that flat running to? It's like 85% the length of the blade, decent amount of room to drop down towards the edge. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah, it's, uh, this is all hollow ground. I hate touching it. I really do because I don't want to mess it up with my fingerprints or anything like that. It says carry on one side and that's it. Um, edges up here, all knocked down, all of this, just beautiful. The jimping is, is nice. The, really the only sharp edge on any of this is really just the corners of the flipper tab. And it's not, I mean, it, I just, it's my instinct to critique little things like that, but it, it seems silly to do that. I love the little touch that he's got going on here. Uh, we might as well look at centering. It's absolutely dead. Perfect. I think you could expect that the, um, the way that he does the texturing on the liners, that is just gorgeous. It's beautiful. I love it. I'm a huge fan of the orange peel texturing. I think that's nice. This is a apparently a dragon. They call it a dragon spine uh, backspacer. <laughs> I think that's cool. And it really does look like the spine of a dragon, right? Or almost like dragon scales. It's just neat. He's got the lanyard hole back here coming off the back. I think that's a nice way to do that. Pocket clip is going to carry it about medium depth. Uh, this is, I would call something like this shallow, right? It doesn't need to be ultra deep, but it looks nice. Uh, the pocket clip and backspacer are both just a darkened titanium. Some people are going to prefer this type of contrast with Timascus, right? Where it's, it breaks it up. You can see like on my dragonfly, I've got the backspacer and the pocket clip, all Timascus. A lot of people look at that and say, that's too busy. Uh, you, if you if you do a different finish or a different material for the backspacer and pocket clip, you can get that contrast. And I think this is a good example of that. We have Timascus, then you have the um, orange peel textured liners, then the darkened titanium, and then it's a repeat for the materials on the other side. And then the pocket clip is again darkened titanium. So it looks nice. It's a nice breakup, nice contrast. The bead is also Timascus, <laughs> beautiful. Um, lock up on this guy is completely and totally solid. You'll have to take my word for it. That is generally the case with, you know, we're talking about not all custom knives are created equal, right? Just because it's a custom knife does not mean it's created with absolutely perfect tolerances. It takes, you know, and I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm ultra familiar with Peter Carey other than his name. That name is just bouncing around in, in you know, my subconscious as that is a name that I once heard as a knife enthusiast, right? That's that's literally all I knew. Apparently, he's been making knives since 1997. You can get this information off of his website. Um, likes to focus on tactical stuff and tactical dress knives. Does fixed blades, various uh, folders, um, and works with zirconium, timascus, titanium, of course, carbon fiber, G10. Uh, works with S35VN, RWL34, stainless Damascus, and probably a number of other things. This is fairly typical of what I see from custom knife makers, but making knives since 1997, 
yeah, uh, that's going to make him stand apart from, you know, some new custom maker that just popped out of the woods in the last couple of years. The guy's obviously been making knives for a long time. I didn't necessarily need to read that on his website to pick that up. This is clearly something, this is clearly the work of somebody who's been doing this for a long time and cares nothing of the critiques of some random YouTuber, right? So, uh, another reason that I just don't, I, I don't critique stuff like this. It's not, not in my, my range of expertise. The stop pin is located back here. It's a nice, beefy, robust stop pin. Same stop pin for the closed, uh, in the closed position. And then you do have some shouldering right here, which is nice. I'm a huge fan of titanium liner locks. I've said this many times over and over and over again. I have come to not dislike exposed frame locks, but I have come to prefer them less versus a titanium liner lock. In fact, this is probably my favorite locking setup. I'm not saying it's the strongest. People like to automatically assume when I say favorite that I mean strongest. No, I don't care nearly as much about potential lock strength because as I've repeated many, many times, uh, I think that knives like uh, you know the some of the Demco stuff, the Shark Lock or the Triad Lock, or the Scorpion Lock, very impressive, incredibly strong, undoubtedly stronger than anything else on the market right now. But I think it's in complete and total excess. I think that the amount of force that it would take to break a lock like that is beyond normal human force. So. Uh, applying normal human force under reasonable circumstances that you would actually use a knife in, I don't think you're going to notice a difference between a liner lock and a, uh, a triad lock. I think you'd have to put the blade in a vise and beat the handle with a sledgehammer to prove the difference in strength between a triad lock and a liner lock. And people are going to say, well, I've had a liner lock slip. Well, it depends on the knife and the geometry and the circumstances that you were using it in. If you're using it like a knife, you'll probably never have a problem with the liner lock. If you're using it um, like a, a toy airplane and throwing it, right, seeing if it can fly, if it's aerodynamic, probably not a good idea. Using it to scale a building, pry the door off a bomb shelter, as a grappling hook, yeah, liner lock probably isn't going to work for that. Um, so, yeah, anyways, when I say that I prefer a liner lock, it's for manipulation. Uh, ease of manipulation, ease of uh, disengagement, right? One-handed manipulation. It's just easy. I like it. Uh, but I don't have to worry about where I'm putting my hands on this side. If it's an exposed frame lock, right, you, you got to watch out for where your fingers are. Because if you put pressure on that lock bar, the detent ball is going to stick in that detent hole, and it's going to make it harder to deploy. You can put your fingers wherever you want here. So I really like that that's the case here. I, I think that that's, that's beautiful. I love that he anodized the screws to make them kind of, they're, they're a little hidden uh, amidst the Timascus. You know, had he left them kind of like this, had he done this, where it's just like a screw holding the inlay in, you can, you, you know that screw's there because it looks different than the rest of the, the knife, right? Even on my um, uh, Dragonfly, which uh, honestly, I, I think it, it looks fine. It's, it adds some contrast in the right place. But because all of the hardware on this guy is anodized, pivot and, you know, handle screws and all, all that, it's all hidden. And then the contrast where you're supposed to appreciate it, the pocket clip, the liners, the backspacer, it's all, you know, uh, it, it all looks good is what I'm saying. This is really, uh, it's, this is one of those knives where it's like, you know, I, I do appreciate it as an art piece. I do, but gosh, it's so functional. Like, I mean, it's this thing is, <laughs> you could totally take this thing out and use it and have it be a reliable, dependable, durable cutting tool uh, for the rest of your life. And because it's made out of RWL34, you can easily, the average person can figure out how to sharpen this pretty easily. Stainless, holds a reasonable edge, plenty tough. RWL34, along with your CPM154, your 154CM, um, and there's a couple other in there, a couple other knife steels that are very, very similar. Um, they're constantly being hailed as amazing user steels because of their balance. That's a lot of the reason that you see RWL34 on so many custom knives. It's because, yeah, I mean, obviously, from my perspective, the, these, these custom knife makers want to show off their talent and ability um, to shape and form uh, materials like Timascus, titanium, and steel into these beautiful objects. But at the same time, they want to make darn sure that if you actually wanted to take this out and use it, 
that it would perform well. Not saying that he'd used M390, M398, Vanax, right? Damacore, whatever, that it wouldn't have been able to perform. Um, but a lot of these guys, you know, who have been making knives since, well, in this case, like the 90s, uh, they have a lot of experience with a lot of different steels, right? So their preferences come from, I have to imagine, a massive buffet, if you will, of potential, you know, diff different steels in different work environments. Um, so it doesn't surprise me at all that we see steels like RWL34 on custom knives from makers who have been making knives for a long time. It's just got good balance, good versatility. It's going to be useful and beneficial and uh, it's, it's going to be a steel that creates efficiency in a wide variety of different circumstances. Oh, listen to me. Oh. <laughs> Metal Complex is doing a good job of masking that he doesn't actually know what he's talking about by uh, using a lot of really nice fluffy words. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Um, I'm not uh, well educated enough to really be able to understand every last little thing that goes into creating. In fact, I'm not well educated enough to understand even the tip of the iceberg when it comes into creating something like this. I can appreciate it as somebody who has handled many, many knives of various calibers, right? Your budget tier, your production, your mid-tech, your semi-custom, your high-end custom, your full-dress custom, right? I've handled a lot of stuff like that. Not an enormous amount towards the upper end, but enough to where I can pick this up and go, this good, this and I feel good, sparkly, shiny, like, me like. <laughs> I mean, they... I'm coming at this like a caveman, but I still want to share this with you because I think it's beautiful. I think 26 minutes is enough. Just realized how long I've been talking. Can't stress this enough. My favorite part of this knife is the action. It's beautiful. It looks nice, but my goodness, the action is just ridiculous, guys. It's great. One of the nicest actions I've felt. All right, Scott, thanks so much for sending in this beautiful knife. I'll have this safely returned to you. Um, actually, by the time this video goes up, you'll probably have it. Uh, in any case, make sure you guys follow Sierra underscore bound on Instagram. Check out Peter Carey Knives. Follow him on Instagram. Check out his website. Beautiful stuff. I have no idea what's involved in uh, getting on his books or getting something made. Um, I would imagine, like many custom, uh, prestigious custom knife makers, it's not going to be super duper easy, but I suppose it wouldn't hurt to ask. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.